as was mentioned, it's, it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to uh, launch, as it were, this conference for a number of reasons. Uh, as was said, um, in a purely professional sense, uh, the case that launched me on the world, and whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, I leave to your own judgment, uh, was the case of Healy and Donoghue, the case that established the constitutional entitlement to uh, legal aid. And that case started when the mother of a co-applicant to Mr Healy, a man called Anthony Foran, came through the doors of Ballyfermot and Flack Centre sometime around 1974, when Flack was only five years old, uh, with a problem about her son being in prison and not having been represented at the trial. Uh, and that led uh, through Flack uh, to me as a young uh, junior counsel. Uh, we in, in, uh, trusted the, the soliciting job to uh, Brian Gallagher, uh, who was a very senior member of Flack at the time, brought in leading senior counsel, and the rest is, uh, as they say, history. So I have a, a very personal uh, connection with Flack in that sense. I think we did good by establishing the constitutional right to legal aid, which has perhaps meant that access to justice on the criminal side hasn't been as problematic as on, on the civil side, uh, and it also did some good for me, so it was a win-win situation. Um, I'd just like to, before dealing with the substance of what I want to say, there's a couple of general points I'd like to make. Firstly, you will appreciate some of the issues that may arise uh, for discussion today are issues uh, about what the law is, and they may well find their way in due course into the Supreme Court, so I need to be somewhat circumspect about what I say uh, about some matters. Um, and also, as Edith pointed out, um, I, I do have to do the day job by sitting on an appeal in the Supreme Court in about an hour's time, so you'll forgive me if this is perhaps relatively short and that I uh, make a fast getaway as soon as I'm finished. Uh, but I would like to perhaps reiterate one of the points that Edith made just now and indeed in her article in the Irish Times yesterday. I think this is very much a multi-factored problem. There is no single solution. There are a number of different elements and those elements are perhaps to some extent interconnected. And I'd just like to explore that general theme. Um, I made uh, an address at the Burren Law School a couple of weeks ago in which I spoke about what I consider to be the pillars which support the administration of justice in Ireland. And being someone who is a maths graduate, I like to do things by numbers, and I was always interested in T. Lawrence's seven pillars of wisdom, so I invented the seven pillars that support the administration of justice. But in, prepar in preparing for this, it occurred to me that there's at least a similarity between the pillars that support the administration of justice and the pillars that allow for access to that justice. They're not the same. You can have a very efficient, a very just, a uh, very speedy uh, court system, but people may not be able to use it for all of the kind of reasons that, that we know. So there isn't a, a, an identicality between the, the support of the administration of justice and access to justice, but some of the same themes uh, do apply. Uh, and also, one of the issues I addressed in the Burren was to say that a lot of those pillars are interconnected. Uh, they don't stand alone as individual supports, uh, but they can affect one with the other. There's things you can do, for example, if you have the resources that you can't do if you don't have the resources. And there's a couple of those I'd like to touch on. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to make one point uh, about the conditions in which uh, particularly family justice, is delivered in Dublin because it has been the subject of some debate. It was again mentioned in Eilish's introduction and in her article yesterday. Because I think we need a little bit more clarity about that issue. Um, I fully understand the difficulties which the Department of Justice has in respect of the Hammond Lane project. Essentially, uh, in the last allocation of capital uh, resources, the Department of Justice was given a 150 million envelope for justice public-private partnership projects. And the department is perfectly understandably committed to a number of police uh, projects, which I understand is, are likely to take up 70 million, thus leaving 80 million for the Hammond Lane project. Uh, and we all know the costing for the Hammond Lane project is 140 million. And 
I understand the Minister can't invent more money and to date efforts to persuade the Department of Public Expenditure to provide more money to the justice se sector ha ha have not prevailed. So this is not a complaint uh, about the failure to deliver more money. But some people have suggested that perhaps taking the Supreme Court part out of it uh, might solve the problem. The truth is the numbers don't add up in that way. Uh, if you think about it, whether you have one story or five stories, a building has a roof, it has all sorts of infrastructure. In the case of Hammond Lane, because it's currently a very big hole in the ground beside the forecourts, there has to be a basement. Uh, and therefore, those costs are there whether you build one story or build five stories. And therefore, knocking, say, 15% off the size doesn't knock 15% off the cost. Uh, and we did an exercise in the court service to just do the family law part of it. Um, and that perhaps knocked 20 million off the price, but was still of the order of 115, 120 million, which is way beyond the budget. So the idea that this could simply be solved by taking everything other than family law out of the project just is, is not mathematically correct. Uh, but it also leads me to another aspect, which I think is very relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, and it's this, part of what I've thought was uh, an innovative and very uh, potentially game-changing aspect of the proposed development was that it sought to provide all of the services that are relevant to the resolution of family disputes under one roof, uh, including mediation services uh, and other forms of backup. And the building was actually designed in a way, and hopefully will be built in a way if the money can be found, where almost one side is solving the problem without needing to go to a court, and the other side of the building involved courtrooms so that if you were unable to resolve through mediation or other means, you, you, uh, including legal aid, uh, if, if people wanted legal advice, you then had the courts uh, to resolve them. And I think that does perhaps teach us one thing uh, about access to justice. It isn't just, I think, the ultimate court decision at the end of a court process that delivers justice. It can be delivered in other ways too. Uh, if there is a fair, uh, accessible, quick mediation service that solves people's problems, and particularly in the family law area, I think uh, that's especially desirable, then that is justice as well. And it's part of the solution, and it may well be cheaper, and in many cases it may well be better because a negotiated, mediated solution in family law is much more likely to stick than one which is imposed by a court against the will of individuals. So I don't think we should only focus on the court solution, as it were, anything that provides an effective solution to the legal difficulties uh, which people face can form part of uh, the system. I fully agree with Eilish that we're not just talking about legal aid here. Uh, as you, many of you will know, there's a civil justice review under Peter Kelly, which is coming towards the end of its, uh, its work. I hope that that will uh, produce significant improvements in the court process, that will make the court process more accessible. Uh, and cheaper as well for those who are uh, paying lawyers to access it and more capable of being accessed without lawyers for those who don't. Uh, I've often uh, told the joke, but it remains true and it remains a joke, I think, uh, in, in the bad sense of that word, that um, I have on the shelves of my office in the Four Courts uh, a copy of a book called Wiley's Judicature Acts. Uh, the Judicator Acts in Ireland mirrored their parallel provisions in England and Wales in the 1870s and the 1880s. It was the last kind of great reform of the structures of the courts in Ireland, apart from the bit of renaming that we did on independence. Um, and Mr. Wiley wrote a very fine textbook on the new rules and the new processes of the uh, amalgamated courts called Wiley's Judicature Acts, and it includes the then rules of the superior courts. And it's a slight exaggeration, but I'm not too sure that it is anything more than a slight exaggeration to say that the most radical change between the rules that you read in Wiley's Judicature Acts from the 1880s and the rules of the superior courts today 
is that the number of each of the orders in Wiley's day was in Roman numerals, but today we have radically moved on to Arabic numerals. And we've changed a couple of the words because we're now republic and there's no reference to kings and queens and the like. But a lot of the text is the same. Uh, I remember being involved in a project. Uh, one, one of my jobs is as chair of the committee that is meant to invent Irish terms for legal words. Uh, and we were involved in the process of the translation of the rules of the Superior Courts into Irish, a project uh, which came to fruition two years ago. Um, and it was a big meeting, lots of people, expert professors, retired professors in Irish language, lawyers who uh, pretended at least uh, to know a little bit about Irish. And we were trying to work out words to translate some of the forms in the rules of the Superior Courts. And at the end of the day, the conclusion a lot of us came to was there wasn't a problem with translating the words into Irish. The problem was that the English was so antiquated that we didn't really know what it meant. And a lot of that is because many of those rules are survivors from the 1880s, which in turn were developments on the pre-Judicature Act amalgamation law. So I think it is fair to say that our processes and procedures are outdated, and I very much hope that the results of the Kelly Committee will uh, significantly improve that. But to demonstrate the interconnectivity of all these matters, I suspect there are many things that that committee could recommend which would make life easier, both for legally represented parties and for those who may self-represent, uh, if the courts had more resources. <laughs> Um, there's things courts can do if there is backup, if there's more judge time available for things, which courts can't do when they're under pressure to deliver uh, a, a caseload uh, which is frequently increasing both in number and complexity uh, with the same resources. So the availability of resources and the kind of procedural innovations you can, can make are, are to some extent interconnected. Also, the court service has... Uh, commissioned um, <coughs> consultants and we hope within the next month to be able to adopt a major plan designed to greatly increase the use of IT in the courts, uh, something I very much favour and uh, sorry I won't be here to hear the debate about what's happened in, in, in the UK but I think there are very interesting developments there but again there's a resources issue, there's no point pretending you can do it unless you put the money into the IT uh, backup which allows it uh, to work, thus again emphasising the connectivity. <clears throat> but I, I think, as I already said, a key element inevitably has to be legal aid, though it is by no means the only piece of the jigsaw. And I'd just like to finish by making a couple of observations on that. Um, one of the things that um, I suppose I've learned over the last number of years, particularly by involvement in the bodies that represent Supreme Courts uh, throughout the European Union, whether they be administrative Supreme Courts or ordinary Supreme Courts, is a greater understanding of the comparative methodologies of the civil and uh, common law systems. I think it is fair to say, at least at a very general level, that one of the key differences in the process is that the common law system places much greater demands on the parties uh, whereas the civil, and there is a transference of part of the role to the parties from what would be done by the courts or, co or court backup in, in, in a civil law system. And that has consequences. Uh, if you look at the figures for expenditure as a percentage of GDP across the European Union, the lowest percentage is Ireland, at less than 0.2% of GDP being spent on the justice system. Um, the UK is quite near the bottom, and the two sort of mixed systems of Malta and Cyprus are, are in the lower part. So I think it's quite clear what one can't do exact comparisons because even defining what's counted to be a court varies from country to country. Nonetheless, I think the figures are clear enough to show that there's a significantly lower expenditure on the court system by the taxpayer in a common law country compared with a comparable civil law country. So the taxpayer saves money, and we could debate just how much, and it perhaps would require a much more rigorous exercise to do that with any degree of exactitude. 
but undoubtedly the taxpayer saves significant money by operating a common law system which places some of the burden on the parties. I think that at least partly explains why the expense for parties is a lot more in a common law system than it typically would be in a civil law system. The taxpayer outsources part of the role that is conducted by a judge in a civil law system to the parties. It saves the taxpayer money and it costs the parties money. And thereby, by costing the parties money, creates an additional layer of a barrier to the ability to access the courts in cases where you would need legal assistance. This is a back of an envelope calculation. But if you look at the figures in the latest justice scoreboard published by the EU, you could certainly take the view that a typical civil law system spends about three times as much as a typical common law system as a percentage of GDP. The total cost of the Irish uh, court system, if you include judges' salaries and pensions and capital provisions and the like, is probably somewhere a bit downward of 200 million a year, perhaps 170 million a year, depending on what you include. If I'm right in saying as a crude estimate, that a civil law system might cost three times as much, that suggests a civil law system in Ireland would cost 500 million a year or thereabouts. On that crude view, and I think it would be useful for someone to do this exercise a bit more rigorously than I'm doing as a pure back of the envelope, but the suggestion thereby is that the Irish taxpayer is probably saving somewhere between 250 and 350 million a year by passing the book of part of the litigation process onto the parties. And if that's correct, it seems to me that it represents a very powerful argument for saying, well, OK, there may be big corporations where that's fine, they can pay for it themselves. But it is a powerful argument for a significantly expanded system of legal aid, because the taxpayer is saving money by running a system which places a greater burden on the parties. And where those parties don't have the resources to provide that catch-up themselves, I think there is a powerful argument uh, for uh, significantly increased legal aid. And if the number is even of the order of magnitude I'd suggested, you can see that even a fraction of that, I suspect, would make the Legal Aid Board very happy in the ability to provide a much expanded uh, service. Um, that's not to say that other elements of making the system cheaper should not be explored. Uh, and whether for those who are self-financing or those who have to be funded or those who may choose or be forced to access the justice system themselves. All of those matters are absolutely correct, uh, but I think legal aid will remain a, a, a significant part of the equation, and I think the saving that, is, uh, that, that the taxpayer is benefiting from today can be used as a powerful argument. Uh, the last point I'd make um, again touches on legal aid. I was very glad to see that one of the uh, sessions will consider the potential effect of international instruments on the legal aid environment. Um, it is interesting, and I consider it to be something of a sleeping giant at the moment, uh, the, the terms of Article 47 of the European Treaty. The, the advantage, of course, of it being an EU measure, the sorry, of the Charter, the advantage of it being an EU measure is it's directly applicable, as it were, as a matter of law in Ireland, as opposed to the slightly less uh, direct way in which we have incorporated the Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but what Article 47 says is that if you are engaged with European rights uh, in litigation, and if the vindication of those rights necessitates legal aid, then there's a charter obligation to provide legal aid. Um, it's perhaps an underexplored area, but again, if I'm right in saying that what the common law system does, at least in part, is shift some of the burden onto the parties from uh, the state, then one of the consequences of that is perhaps to mean that legal aid is necessitated in a wider range of cases than might otherwise be so. If the judge takes on the burden in a civil law system uh, of doing a lot more of the work, as it were, it may well be that a lawyer, while it might be useful, is not necessary. 
But in a system such as ours, where the party takes on a much greater part of the burden of carrying the litigation, it may well be that a lawyer is necessitated to effectively vindicate rights in a wider range of cases. Uh, and while one might say it only applies in its terms, as it does, to cases where rights under European law are engaged, the truth is that's an increasingly wide range of rights. Uh, European law now finds its way into many different areas uh, and I would have thought it's not beyond the wish of clever lawyers uh, to identify how European law is involved in a wider range of cases and make the case that the, the Charter thereby requires legal aid if it can be demonstrated that there isn't effective access to justice. So as I say, that's wholly separate from the very special cost rules that apply in the environmental field that Dr. Ryle will talk about later. But this is of general application to any area where there is uh, an EU element to the case. I, I've described it, and I suspect I've described it accurately, as a sleeping giant. And if, after 50 years of flak, we are correct, as Eilish has suggested, and I'm not going to disagree with her, that we haven't made a great deal of progress in access to justice in, in the civil side, um, it may be that these instruments, international instruments, may provide the means by which much more significant progress may be capable to be made over the next 10, 20, or 30 years. Uh, I'm sorry that I won't be able to share in the debate. Uh, I'm sure my spies will be able to tell me uh, the outcome uh, 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 and any interesting information obtained. I wish everyone well, uh, and it is genuinely with some regret uh, that I have to say that uh, I won't be able to be here for the rest of the meeting uh, because the day job calls. Thank you very much for your attention.